on the hamilton.org website. If you are in need of a prayer or want to have our weekly service bulletin emailed to you, please contact our church office at 513-863-5774 or email us at zionlutheranoffice at gmail.com. Leading the service is Vicar Patty Ian. Our music director is Bill Seal. The lector is Sonia Smith. Prelude is Dia de Lago per Organo. Special music is God is My Shepherd. Postlude is Prelude and Fugue in A minor. Now we begin with our prelude. God is good all the time. This Saturday is kayaking and dinner for the adult fellowship. Go by the times in the announcement page, not the time that is on the sign-up sheet. You can do one or the other or both, but please sign up because they need a head count, especially for the dinner. Lydia's Ladies meets this Tuesday at 10.30. Please join us. There's plenty of room at the table. And on August 3rd, we're having our 180th anniversary wrap-up picnic. And our community meal center on Friday afternoon and evening. Um, the meal starts at 3 o'clock. We open the doors. We serve at 5 and we close at 7. We are in dire need of help. Even if the help is making a dessert and bringing it to the church for us. But we do need help serving. We need help just being there with our guests. If you have some free time on a Friday. Are there any announcements from the congregation? If not, let's prepare for worship by listening to Bill's prelude. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <clears throat> Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Please kneel if you are able. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us, even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing, O Holy Spirit, enter in. our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. O oh God, from you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the lessons. Good morning. Good morning. The first lesson is Amos 7, 7 through 15. <clears throat> this is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, See, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. I will never again pass them by. The highest places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise again in the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amiza, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jer Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amiza said to Amos, O seer, Go, flee away to the land of Judiah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from the following flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophecy, prophecy to my people, Israel. Word of God, word of life. Thanks. Psalm 85, 8 through 13. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying. Truly, your salvation is very near to those who fear you. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity. Righteousness shall go before the Lord. The second lesson of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, 
things in heaven, and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. Word of God, word of life. Stand. According to Saint Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. <clears throat> okay. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the Baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, And yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved Yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Holy Gospel of our Lord. As we sing the doxology, would the youngsters please come join me?
Good morning. We're going to talk today about adults behaving badly. Let's play a game. Who am I? I wear very coarse clothing and I eat locusts and honey. I am Jesus' cousin. John the Baptist, exactly. What else did John the Baptist do? Did he dunk people in the water to baptize them? Did he tell people that they needed to repent of their sins? Yes. John had a job. John was Jesus' cousin. And his job was to prepare the way for Jesus to come into the world and do his mission. And John did his job well. He told people to repent their sins. He told people of the coming of Jesus, some, a prophet who was better than he. He said he did not have the ability to clean Jesus' sandals because Jesus was above him. Well, John did his job so well that he got himself into trouble. Unfortunately, what he did was he told King Herod that by marrying his brother's wife, he was sinning and he needed to repent. Well, he made an enemy of that wife because the wife wanted to be married to the king and she did not want John causing problems in her marriage. So as the scripture said, she wanted him to be killed. So she figured out a way how to do that. And um, King Herod gave a birthday party. His stepdaughter, Herodias, Herodias's daughter, her name was Solom, Solom, Salome, I believe is how you pronounced it. She danced for King Herod and the guests. And she so pleased the king that he said, I will give you anything. And she went out and asked her mother what I should ask for. And Herodias, the wife of King Herod, found a way to kill John because she instructed her daughter to ask for the head of John the Baptist, which she did. That is definitely adults acting very poorly, behaving badly and doing evil things. Unfortunately, we live in a world where there are people who will do bad things and they will hurt other people. And what we do is we need to do good and always look for those people being evil. And if we should see someone hurting someone else, we need to tell someone who can help them so that we can help prevent somebody from being injured. But in this time, this king had power and he could do whatever he wanted. And he behaved very badly. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, it scares me that there are people in our world who do bad things to others. Please protect me from them. If I see something bad happening to another person, please give me the courage to report what I see to someone who can help. God, please help our very troubled world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may return to your seats. I forgot to print out the, the uh, little missiles for you today. My printer was sort of a little on the fritz. So, there was a time, shortly after Pastor Joe left us, that Robin Kalin, Aaron Sanchez, and I took turns doing worship. And we did a rotation. And it seemed that every time Aaron came up in the rotation, there was a gospel lesson that was so difficult to preach on that she had to really struggle with. So when I got this gospel reading today, I said, hmm, I should ask Erin to preach. <laughs> but I did not. Uh, this is not a pleasant gospel to preach on. And I prayed, and I read, and I contemplated, what am I going to say to you today? What do you say about somebody being beheaded? So last Sunday, we talked about injustices. This is a whopper of an injustice. A man's life was taken because a disgraceful leader and a hateful woman 
had their own agenda. Mark's telling of the beheading of John is 16 verses long. It's the longest accounting of this story in the gospel. Luke tells about it in two lines. Matthew has a version that I read that helped me understand things a little bit better and to discern what I was going to say to you today. Matthew's version appears in Matthew 14. And verse 12 says, John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus was nowhere to be found. And I, in Mark's gospel that we read. I like Matthew's rendition because it gives us a little bit more substance to think about when we think about a beheading of a prophet. Now Matthew 14 in, in verse 13, which we leave from the beheading of John and we go into the feeding of the 5,000. But what verse 13 says is when Jesus heard what had happened, the beheading, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. However, the solitary place was not so peaceful or private. Because as we remember with the feeding of the 5,000, the crowd followed him. So Jesus did not get a chance to grieve the way he wanted to. And our story goes directly into the feeding of the 5,000. Many theologians and many of us that are learning this text to help preach to you, we wonder why in the world does Mark sandwich the beheading of John between Jesus sending the disciples out to preach the good news and the feeding of the 5,000? What was he thinking? We don't know what he was thinking. So there's all kinds of speculation. There's all kinds of theories. I did some, I, I shouldn't say some reading. I did a lot of reading <laughs> on this text to figure it out and to figure out what did I think. I had what the theologians thought. But as I contemplated on this, I pulled a couple of different things out. I'm thinking that perhaps this was sandwiched in between those two stories, one of which was how Jesus was doing his mission by sending out his disciples and a miracle. I think this was sandwiched in there to compare leaders, for you to be able to discern what is a good leader and what is a bad leader. Let's look at that evil, ghastly Herod. This is not Herod the Great. This is not the Herod who searched for Jesus to kill him. This is his son. His name is actually Herod Antipas. He wasn't a king. He was a tet tetrarch. tetrarch. That's a ruler of a fourth of the kingdom. All he did was rule Galilee. He called himself a king, but he really wasn't a king. He was more concerned with appearances and his reputation and himself than he was with the life of John the Baptist. In order to preserve his standing, because he had said he would give Salome anything she wanted, oaths back then carried a lot of weight. So when you make an oath, you need to follow through with it. But that's not the reason he followed through with it. He was more worried with what would people say. I promised her something and now I'm not going to give it to her. So this feeling of selfishness and self-need took John the Baptist's life. Just so you know just a tad more, on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he was taken to Herod. This was Herod Antipas who had beheaded John and rejected John's teachings. And he also did the same thing to Jesus. He rejected him. Now let's talk about the godly ruler. Jesus has just heard about the death of his cousin and he was grieving. He wanted to grieve. He wanted to go to a quiet place so he could pray 
and he could grieve for his cousin and be with his father. So he got in a boat and he went to what he thought would be a quiet place only to find out the people had traveled on land and met him right where he was going. And the people were calling for him. And when Jesus saw the crowd, he knew that it was more important for him to take care of his people than it was for him to grieve. So he had to put his grief aside and go out and do his mission of helping other people. John's job was done. And actually the beheading of John spurred Jesus' mission even more. It sort of put it into overdrive. It was shifting into a higher gear. The people needed Jesus. And Jesus went and took care of his flock. The awful, evil leader cares only for himself. The godly leader cares for others first. That, I thought, was a very important message in this particular gospel reading. Then I looked a little further. And I said, you know what? In Matthew, in that verse 12, it talks about John's disciples. John's disciples came and asked for his body so that they could bury him. And it made me thought about Jesus' disciples. After the crucifixion, Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And along with Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, they took him to the tomb and they wrapped him for burial. And then, on that very first Easter Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb to help anoint the body with the oils and herbs that they didn't have a chance to do on the Friday. All of these people, John's disciples, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, and the women, all took great risk to follow through with what their faith led them to do. The women were at risk from the Roman soldiers. John's disciples were at risk from what Herod might say. And of course, Pilate could have squashed Joseph of Arimathea taking the body. So they all put themselves in a risky situation. They were risk takers for the glory of God. And as we read our Bibles, there are many risk takers for the glory of God. They take risks, they took risks, they suffered, some were tortured, some died. Being uncompromising in faith and speaking the word of God can bring dire consequences. That's what one article I read said. In John 8 verse 23, it says, the truth will set you free. But we realize by reading the Bible that the truth can also create some pretty awful situations for the person telling the truth. This is the paradox at the heart of our Gospels. Another article that I read said, our affirmation of and allegiance to the truth of the Gospel cannot be a hedged position. It is all or nothing, regardless of the consequences. And that's how those, the heroes and heroines in our Bible looked at living their faith. I have the privilege of going to seminary with a man who grew up in communist China. As a young adult, he preached the good news. And he was put into prison. And he was hurt. And every day he said they would come and try and make him denounce his faith. And every day, he would not denounce his faith. Blessedly, someone helped him get out of that prison, and he made his way to America. When he made his way to America, he landed in Brooklyn, New York. In Brooklyn, New York, there's a large population of people from China. What this man has done is he's been preaching God's word to his people in Brooklyn, New York ever since he came to America in 2000. 
and he baptizes several people every single Sunday. This is a man who I met in my team program. He has finished his program and he will be graduating with me in May. Thank God for him. But he is an example of a person in to, of today who is uncompromising in his faith. He will live his faith and spread his faith and his belief no matter what. In this country of freedom, I have never been persecuted for my faith, nor have I been told to denounce my faith. I am not so sure where I would fall if I was asked to do so, to be 100% honest with you. I don't know if I would fall short of that mark. There is another comparison in this story that I sort of pulled out. There's a comparison between Herod and Pilate. It gives you two examples of poor leaders, weak leaders, selfish leaders. Herod concedes to the order of, ex of execution of John so that he doesn't look ridiculous. Pilate, even though he thought Jesus was innocent, he conceded to the wishes of the people and he ordered Jesus' execution just because he wanted people to like him and he couldn't think of anything else to do. History was repeating itself from Herod to Pilate. But isn't that what we needed to have done? We can't have Easter and the resurrection story without first having the crucifixion. So Pilate was actually a portion of bringing forth that beauty for us and that gift for us. So what is the good news in the Gospel of Mark 6? There is good news. You just have to filter it out and figure it out. Jesus is obviously grieving for the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. He wanted quiet. He wanted to pray. He wanted to grieve. I'm wondering, as Jesus was grieving, did he see John the Baptist's death as a preview of his own? So was there a little trepidation and fear involved in his emotions? These are all human emotions. Our wonderful God came down from heaven to us and became human, which makes me feel John's death mattered to God. God didn't ignore it. God cared about the fact that John had been executed. God cares about us in our suffering. He cares if we are hurt and if we are harmed. God loves us and cares about us and mourns us when things go awry. I'm going to wrap up this sermon with a little poem and you all know that Helen Steiner Rice is my favorite poet. Her poem is called, It's a Comfort to Know. Oh, that baby, so gorgeous. <laughs> Oh God, what a comfort to know that you care and to know when I seek you, you will always be there. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Please join me in singing hymn number 249 on Jordan's Banks, The Baptist's Cry.
the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please kneel as you are able for the prayers. One, in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer. You gather your people into the body of Christ. Where your church is wounded, heal it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is divided, reunite it. Lift up Zion Lutheran Church in Middletown and First Baptist Church in Hamilton. In your mercy. From before the foundation of the world, you are God. Revive ecosystems destroyed by human greed. Curb our desires to put wealth ahead of the health of all who call this planet home. In your mercy. You establish equity and make justice within every nation, tribe, and land. Cause laws to be written and customs to be observed that protect the most vulnerable. In your mercy. Be with those involved in hurricanes, tornadoes, and shootings. Be with our government as it navigates this election. Lead us all in the way you would have us go. Hear our prayer. In your mercy. On the cross, your beloved son endured pain and death. Bring healing to those in need, hope to any in despair, and comfort to the dying. We pray especially for Paula, Kathy, Ron, Peg, Brian, Barbara, Sherry, Dave, Sonia, Shirley, Sarah, Kathy, John, Heidi, Frank, Patty, Dennis, President Trump, as well as those we hold silently on our hearts. We pray for doctors, nurses, and health care workers who provide care. We lift our friends at home, especially Karen and Phil Flammer. In your mercy, you sent your spirit into this community of faith. Empower our ministries that serve and build up local communities, including the Open Door Pantry, Community Meal Center, and Grace Works. Nurture our partnerships with other community organizations. In your mercy, all peoples praise you, O God. We give you thanks and praise for the lives of our loved ones who now rest in you, especially Jim Truitt and Bob Niederman, and the fullness of time gathered with us, all your saints in light. In your mercy. And also with you.
Okay, I invite the ushers to come forward while Paula praises God with her beautiful voice. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body, for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting light. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
our maker, redeemer, and healer. In the harmonious world of your creation, the plants and animals, the seas and stars were whole and well in your praise. When sin has scarred the world, you sent your son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. In the night in which our dear Lord was betrayed, he took bread. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this is the cup of, the, of blood in the new covenant. This, this blood is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering therefore his acts of healing, his body given up, and his victory over death, we await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us and this meal as grains scattered on the hillside become one bread. So let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth that all may be fed with the bread of life, your son. Through him all glory and honor is yours. Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set the table, and more than enough, with, with more than enough for all. Come. Zion Lutheran practices Eucharistic hospitality, communing members of all Christian fellowships. All are invited to commune with us. Stephen, if you need to leave early for work, please come forward first. Okay. You may be seated.
Please stand. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than, we, more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Please join me in singing, Holy God, we praise your name.
I'd like to thank all of those who assisted with our worship service this morning. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Reaching out with God's love.